Welcome to the Filmlings Podcast. A staccato podcast where we analyze all that goes into effective filmmaking. I'm Jonathan. And I'm Alex. And this is episode 158, Cahiers du Cinéma Part 1, Jean-Luc Godard. Not Jean-Luc Picard, that would be a very different podcast. But yeah, Jonathan, before we get into everything today... Uh, while this did not arrive on time to make a major contribution to the information in this episode, I did order a book on the French New Wave uh, by Richard Newport. If you Google New- Richard Newport French New Wave, it will pop up. Um, but I didn't have time to read the chapter on Jean-Luc Godard, but there's a quote from Jean-Luc Godard at the top of that chapter that I think prepares us for the discussion on French New Wave better than any of the other collated information I have brought to begin this episode with. And it goes like this. Criticism has taught us to love both Rouche and Eisenstein, and that we must not neglect one sort of cinema in the name of some other mode. A young writer today is aware of Moliere and Shakespeare. Well, we are the first directors to be aware of D.W. Griffith. Even Marcel Carnet, Louis de la... Deluc and Rene Clair have no real critical or historical background. Fr- by John Luc Godard, uh, from a probably an article in uh, Cahier du Cinema, but uh, I am not going to try to read more French than I can bite off today. Alex, what is Cahier du Cinema? That's an interesting phrase. Cahier du Cinema will actually come up in the biography of Jean-Luc Picard that I've prepared for today's episode. Did you say Picard? it kind of, uh, in brief, it's the magazine that, uh, it's a film criticism magazine that appeared in France in the 50s and 60s. And the five major writers of that magazine all became major directors of a movement called the French New Wave. And yeah. unlike many other movements we've talked about on the podcast, the French New Wave very consciously thought of itself as a movement and called itself the French New New Wave right. or Nouveau Vogue or whatever it's called in French. Um, but it is a major moment in cinema history. Um, and it is, it's one of the most influential moments the period of the set of films made over the 60s by this set of five directors, as well as their accomplishment accomplices in the left bank uh, film community, like Agnes Farda, who we've mentioned and done an episode before in the podcast on, uh, is some of the most influential work ever. And we kind of haven't really done a deep dive on it. And we really want to do that. Um, and we're also really keen on doing director episodes. So we are structuring this series with the idea of doing those five major directors um, back to back to back and using them as a vehicle to discuss what the French New Wave is, how it changed cinema, and how it changed the way we talk about and think about cinema. Uh, Because while these people are directors, they're also big nerdy film critics and the way they talked and thought about cinema kind of became the format that we talk and think about cinema to this day, um, which is not how it was thought of before. So in that regard, pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's there's something that I've been thinking through that I think Godard touched on in that in that quote you mentioned, which is that there's there's this interesting shift from uh filmmakers who were literarily influenced to filmmakers who were cinematically influenced uh, and filmmakers who have a background in literature make very different films from filmmakers who are almost exclusively influenced by cinema itself. And I think the French new wave is a really interesting point where we're shifting away from literature based cinema uh, and exploring what, film itself has to bring to the table apart from the narrative techniques that work really well in literature and were employed really well by some of the golden age American uh, directors in particular. And so we're taking some of the best of that and transforming it and exploring the forms of cinema itself and what 
is cinema and what kinds of effects does it have that are different than when you're reading a book. I think nowadays we have filmmakers who are almost exclusively influenced by cinema and sometimes only pop cinema and it kind of becomes this recursive game of telephone where films just start regurgitating themselves and they kind of go downhill but this is kind of an interesting sweet spot and a shift where the French New Wave directors are all incredibly um, literary, literary so they have both the literary and the cinematic uh, background and training to create some really really interesting films uh, and so it's going to be really cool to see the ways that they go about this and it's also it's not I mean, these these guys made some really great films, but this is an explorative period. Period. It's not like everything they did was flawless. It's a little bit messy sometimes, but it's fascinating to kind of see the work in progress of what film can be. Exactly. And today we'll be talking about one of the foremost experimenters, one of the people who really enjoyed to break the rules. Yeah. Um, as much as he respected the rules that came before, he also loved to mess with them. And sometimes it's brilliant and sometimes it's just a little awkward. But his body of work is super influential, especially in the 60s. So we have to talk about him. That's Jean-Luc Godard. He was born on December 3rd, 1930 in Paris. Um, but his father was Swiss and would move the family back there for the duration of World War II. Probably a good call. Uh, yeah. but also the fact that Jean-Luc Godard, uh, was half Swiss would play a pretty major role in his life. He would make a lot of movies in Switzerland, especially after his French new wave era, era, era. And he spent, I don't know if a majority of his life, but certainly in the majority of, uh, the last years of his life in Switzerland as well. He was not what you would call an academic standout. Um, and he took uh, two attempts to pass his bac or his baccalaureate, uh, which is a test in France that's about the equivalent of an A-level in the UK, something that would either qualify you to get into um, university or to um, to serve as a technical uh, certificate if you're going to go into a technical profession. Uh, and while he would enroll in university for anthropology, he would never actually attend. He was not a big film watcher as an adolescent, actually, or child. In fact, he was introduced to cinema via an outline, because he was a much bigger reader, uh, titled The Outline of a Psychology in Cinema, which is honestly a pretty good primer for like his whole approach to cinema. Um, and in addition to that, he would hang out with people who were big film fanatics, and maybe more importantly, quite a few... Uh, philosophers and wannabe philosophers made up his friend group very early on in his life. But in the 1950s, like basically 1950 itself, um, he would move back to Paris and a lot of his free time would begin to revolve around the cinema, cinema clubs or cinema clubs that were starting to pop up in the Latin quarter of Paris. Uh, among these, the most prominent three for Jean-Luc Godard in particular, were the Cinémathèque Française, the Cineclub du Courtoir Latin, I'm butchering this language, I apologize, and Work and Culture Cine Club. Um, these cinema clubs were places where film fanatics would gather to watch silent films and classic era great films and discuss their importance and their techniques and just basically nerd out about movies. Um, these films were often discussed in the manner one would discuss the work of great philosophers. So this was not how people talk about like the latest Marvel movie. I know Marvel's our punching bag, but like it's gonna it's the big thing right now. And it's a good comparison for this. It's so big and um, fluffy and fun to punch. It's not it's not like people talking about the latest Marvel movie where they go, oh, my God, can you believe they did this? Or they brought in this character. And who do you think they're going to bring in next? This was people dissecting the movies and talking about the deeper meaning of them and themes and techniques on a very, very nerdy, granular level. And while I'm sure people do talk about that for Marvel somewhere online, I'm sure it happens. That's not the primary discussion of this. This is more like 
what we do here on the Filmlings podcast. And in fact, I think the Cine Clubs might be the clearest vision of what the Filmlings has in part aspired to be in a lot of ways, where we talk about old great movies, pick them apart, discuss their uh, their influences and influencers and kind of try to grow as film nerds through that appreciation. But Godard had his own crew of nerds that he would meet at this these clubs. And the list of names he meets here is basically a who's who of the French New Wave and of who we're ca- talking about <laughs> this uh, half of the year on the podcast, um, including names like Jacques Rivette, Claude Chabrol, Francois Truffaut and Eric Romer, which was a basically like a performance name, not actually his real name, but for the sake of clarity, we're just going to call him Eric Romer. Um, just a bunch of nerdy fanboys talking about films and discovering new yeah. ones and comparing their ways of the ways of seeing them. Uh, because make no mistake, they all had their own styles and takes. Along with Romer and Rivette, Godard uh, would start and run a film journal named La Gazette du Cinema for a whopping five months. It would not last. Um, But that was kind of his introduction to film writing and film criticism as a profession. But that would become important because not long after, the names André Bazin, Joseph-Marie Laduca, and Jacques Dano Valcruz in 1951 would found Cahier du Cinema, which we already talked about at the start of the show, but it's super important. It's like the glue that holds together um, the main force of the French New Wave, otherwise what yeah. you might call the right bank of the French New Wave because it was located on the right bank of the Seine River in Paris. And eventually... All five of those names I mentioned before would become major writers at the publication. And in fact, I believe Romer would become the uh, editor-in-chief of the publication in the late 50s. Um, But this kind of brought these names into the international community a little bit. And they really made a name for themselves because their take on cinema was not your grandpa's take on cinema. Yeah. If anyone's interested, the... The phrase Kai du cinema means notebooks on cinema. So Ah, there you go. Yeah. But it's it's interesting too that like again, when we're talking about the ways that films are made and filmmakers are approaching films, all of these guys just started out by watching films and thinking about them and writing down their thoughts for the public and kind of having that uh that larger sphere of conversation about films. Whereas before it was Someone happens to have talent, studio picks them up, and a studio just throws films at them. Uh, and there was... Or someone happens to be related to somebody, and thankfully yeah. they happen to have talent as well. Yeah. And so, yeah, then there's varying degrees of the influence that the directors are able to have over their films, which, of course, the ones who had more more influence on their films were the ones that these guys started picking up. But then, you know... But still, it's like these guys have like all the mind work first and then they have to start putting it into practice. So it's it's a very different perspective than than directors who had come before them. Yeah. And in fact, the people who they praised in their writing were often not the people typically praised by film critics who came before. Uh, Godard in particular would often champion the melodramas of Otto Priminger and Howard Hawks who were both considered working directors who made, uh, you know, B movies, genre movies, crime movies, uh, noir films, uh, courtroom well, films. did everything. Let's be not fair. your, not your high dramas that were supposed to be the main fair of the day or the high artful movies. Uh, meanwhile, Godard was not so much a fan of overly formalistic or overly artful films and in particular, he wasn't such a fan of Orson Welles, which is weird because Orson Welles is a favorite of other members of the uh, French New Wave. And again, yeah. I want to emphasize this. The French New Wave, while they were all buddies, was not monolithic in their approach or styles or who they liked. So while it's easy to say, oh, everyone loved Hitchcock. Well, Francois Truffaut really loved Hitchcock. And while the other people certainly appreciated his work, 
that might not have been the biggest influence on Godard as it was on Truffaut. I did see a quote from Godard where he did say that for a while anyway, and this comes up specifically with Piero Le Fou, but for a while he would ask himself basically, what would Hitchcock do if he hit a snag in his films? And then by the time he got to Piero Le Fou, he was like, I think Hitchcock would just say, figure it out for yourself. And he kind of starts to take his own steps away from emulation, which is something that we're going to talk about. Yeah, they would build their their confidence. Um, but in addition to Wells, uh, he wasn't such a fan of Victoria De Sica, a major mover of the Italian neorealist He's movement, so which wasn't actually was wasn't really considered like a movement by the people who participated in it. Um, and uh, William Wyler as well. Um, but Godard would always be a proponent of techniques for their impactful function rather than their aesthetic form. And that function over form is something very important when it comes to Godard in particular. It's true of all of the people in the French New Wave, uh, regardless of how beautiful their, their, um, their movies end up being. They're not necessarily in it for the aesthetic form. They want to see what these techniques can do to affect the audience and affect the experience of watching their movie. So that's why sometimes Godard's films tend to come off a little staccato um, or awkward in places. Uh, but we'll talk about that more once it gets to the movies themselves. Anyway, at this point, he was still just a writer, but he was starting to help some of his other friends make short films as they were starting to branch out from just writing and watching into making as well. Uh, but he did return to Switzerland for a time, and he worked on the construction of a dam. I'm not entirely sure why he did this. I couldn't find the motivation for it. I guess maybe he needed some money, and his mother lived in Switzerland still. So it seems like he went to go spend some time his with her. His uncle needed help on the job site, you know, whatever. Something like that. Uh, actually, his uh, his mother's lover worked on the job site and became a That's good friend of Godard. That's the most French Godard. thing ever. Yeah, it really is. And became a good friend of Godard during this time. It would actually help him uh, in making his actual first movie, which was a short documentary titled Operation Concrete about the construction of the dam. Um, he would make one more short film in Switzerland, and things start to move fast now. Uh, Godard, uh, but he would soon return to Paris, where the right bank group was in full swing of starting to make French New Waves uh, short films in the late mid, or mid to late 50s. Um, basically, everybody was working on something right now. This is where all the shorts come from. And while people often quote the beginning of the French New Wave to... Uh, uh, Claude Chabrol's Le Beau Surge in 1958, which was the first uh, French New Wave film with the full theatrical release. Notice all the qualifiers I just put in that <laughs> sentence. The The beginning of the French New Wave is not uh, something set in stone. The ones uh, that weren't home videos anymore. Yeah. Uh, the, the French New Wave, in my opinion, really started at this point, when they all start making short films together. They're taking what they learned, nerding out over film for a decade, and applying it to making film. And that's a very important step. But And it would just escalate from there. During this period, Godard began making frequent appearances at film festivals, both for his own short films that he was making, as well as his friends, places like uh, the film festival at Cannes, the film festival at Tours, so on, so on. And... Uh, during this period, he would also meet and become friends with people who, from the left bank film community as well. Agnes Varda, Jacques Demy, Alain René, um, all the big names from the left bank group. So all of these people were in communication with each other and in fact, collaborating uh, with each other frequently. And for instance, like Anna Karina, who would become uh, Jacques uh, Jean-Luc Godard's uh, wife and not too distant from this point in the story. Uh, would appear in quite a few of Agnes Varda's films. Uh, and there was all this cross-pollination between them at this point in time, which really kind of solidified the idea that this was a movement uh, that people were trying to do. That and Truffaut just kept calling it a movement in paper print. <laughs> so it, it, it's one of the reasons why it's so easy to identify as a movement. 
But uh, Godard's first feature, Breathless from 1960, is probably like the movie you know of. Like Breathless and The 400 Blows are probably like the two movies you know of if you know nothing else about the French New Wave, but you do know one thing. It's those. Those two are the movies. ones we covered seven years ago in the uh, in the world tour because yeah. we were we we were thinking what are what are the French films that we should cover and those are the top ones. Those are the ones that always pop up, um, and they're they're really good to watch. But the more that we do this, the more I think that you lose a little bit if you don't explore the context of their creation and some of the other stuff that's made before and after them as well. They do uh, have that, a very jarring effect if you don't have that context, though. Yeah, they do. They do. It can almost come across as just confusing. Like, I remember the first time I watched Breathless in college, I was like, what am I watching? Like, I don't understand what's happening. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that's because these films, one of the reasons it's so confusing is because these films are made in a different time, place, and context than when I was watching them. I had just been told they were good. And so I should watch them. But it's hard to appreciate something so far removed from its own context unless you have a bit of that context to go along with it. Um, but anyway, Breathless marked the start of Godard's French New Wave period, which is about the first decade pretty much of his film career from Operation Concrete through the end of the 60s. Um, and that this is the period where he makes his most famous movies. These are the ones that have the biggest influence on uh, other people. When people talk about Jean-Luc Godard, they're talking about the the 15 or so movies he made from 1960 to 1967. That, those are the ones they're, they're talking about. He, I'll, I'll touch on it briefly. He had other movies he made, um, but they're not nearly as widespread or influential, and there's a lot of reasons for that. Uh, but this is probably a good time to talk about uh, some identifying features of the French New Wave that are kind of going to prime us for talking about these movies today and comparing Godard's take on the French New Wave to the other takes on the French New Wave that we'll be seeing throughout this course. Um, so the first thing to remember, and I've said it before and I'll keep saying it, is that the French New Wave is not a monolith. Each director had their own interpretation and style of what it meant to make this new sort of cinema. They had different people who they favored as influences, and they had different things that they disliked and were trying to avoid. So when you say a French New Wave film, some of the things that I'm about to list off should probably appear when you watch that, but they might not, and that doesn't disqualify it from being a French New Wave film, and that's important to remember. So the first thing that is very important when talking about the French New Wave is the idea of the literariness of cinema. And Jonathan, you actually very thankfully, helpfully talked about this earlier on uh, before we got into the bio. But the idea that cinema had kind of reached this point, evolved, reached a critical mass of body of work, enough people had worked on it, however you want to think about it. Uh, where it had evolved from being simply entertainment or on-screen adaptations of literary text, but into an art form that qualified as a text of literary merit in its own right. Um, in other words, the, the way that I found that was helpful to think about this is imagine, the, the, before this, you might have thought of movies as kind of being like an audiobook. It's a performance of a text but it does not represent a text in and of itself. The audiobook version of The Lord of the Rings, despite the performance put into it, does not uh, add anything of literary merit to the text of Lord of the Rings. But what they're saying here, and what, the, what Truffaut and Godard and their crew really advocated for, was this idea that the suite of techniques that had evolved from... Um, the people who made movies had become significant enough to constitute uh, a literary text that was suitable enough to approach the big questions of human existence um, and really stand on its own. So you could dissect a movie the same way that you would dissect a great novel. Um, and that's how they talked about it in the cinema clubs. And that's how they approached it in the making of their movies as well. Uh, the other really big thing that we need to talk about is the auteur theory. And we've mentioned it many times on the show before. Um, and I've kind of gone 
back and forth on the importance of auteur theory in the making of a movie, but I do think the idea of the auteur theory has played a very big role in movie making, especially since the French New Wave, because the French New Wave guys were so into it. It's this idea that following the previous point that a movie can represent a text in its own right of literary merit, that the author of that text or the person who's responsible for the art behind the cinema is the director. They're the person who is creating their own unique vision and talking to the audience and communicating in this philosophical um, literary way with with, uh, the people who consume the movie. Uh, and that was super big in uh, in the French New Wave. It's talked about all the time in Cahier du Cinema. And it is one of the reasons why uh, these directors were so influenced by other directors. And uh, one of the big reasons why people started to talk about people like Alfred Hitchcock or Howard Hawks as being directors of a certain merit because the French New Wave would talk about them in that way. Um, and of course... And because they're they're some of the ones that took the most control over their films, uh, because like I said, in in the studio system, sometimes it was a producer just wants to make a film because they think it will perform well. But people like Alfred Hitchcock who come in and they've already made the entire film on paper before they show up on set. Alfred Hitchcock was an auteur because he directed every single aspect from he didn't write them, but he directed All the he knew exactly where the camera was going to go. He knew exactly where the actors were going to be. He knew exactly what order the shots were going to be cut in, etc. And you see that in in some of these directors. Frank Capra did a did a lot of taking control of his films. Um, But that's that's the difference from the the studio generated films where anyone could have directed it. It just had to get out because it was based on a book that people that they knew someone was going to go pay to see. Uh, and so, yeah. So, and again, the, the, the French new wave guys were reacting against a lot of studio produced stuff in France. That was just kind of stodgy rehashes of your SAT reading list. Yeah. The Oscar bait of the day. Um, yeah. but those names, uh, Alfred Hitchcock, Howard Hawks, John Ford, Nicholas Ray's, uh, Orson Welles, a lot of American names because American cinema, was had that B tier had space for that B tier of movie where um, people could these genre films basically the crime movies uh, the westerns where people could uh, weren't really adapting something as often as they were um, creating their own interpretation of a thing using that suite of techniques um, that French New Wave writers were so obsessed with. So when they saw those on display, they ate that up. Um, And they would frequently copy their hero's work in their own, or at least pay homage to it. Uh, And you see that a lot in their movies. And if you're familiar with the works of uh, Hitchcock or Hawks or Ford or Ray or Wells, you can see a lot of it in uh, their work. The one that I would recommend the most for Godard is Howard Hawks. Howard Hawks did a lot of crime movies. Jean-Luc Godard talked about Howard Hawks a lot and it shows. It definitely shows. But Hawks um, was also all over the map. Hawks did everything. He did screwballs, he did westerns, he did crime films and he was Godard a is, director. is pretty versatile yeah, He didn't too. have yeah. a lot of control over which movies he made, but whichever movie he was assigned, he would make the best of. His own, yeah. Yeah. And that's that's one of the things that the French New Wave writers really admired about these working directors in America. And then, of course, um, there's it's very easy to hear about the French New Wave and be like, oh, my gosh, everything they did is amazing. But it's also important to remember that with cinema, a lot of the stuff that we praise also kind of uh, forced either like either an accident or forced on you by the nature of circumstances and you're just making the best of what you got. And when it comes to the French new wave, it's important to remember that they had like no money. They, especially at the beginning, very low budget productions, which worked out great because a lot of these movies ended up being very popular and making a lot of money when they were produced for peanuts. So there, there, yeah, there's that progression throughout throughout the French New Wave where they start super scrappy, you know, like 
like we said, kind of home movie short films. Uh, and then they kind of progress and the production quality increases and the, uh, the ideas and the thoughts get a little more formalized and, uh, evolve a bit. But, uh, the way in which each director would handle the, um, the lack of budget would differ. Um, and with Godard, the lack of budget is probably most prominent in his use of jump cuts. Um, and you'll see that you'll see that less in his later work, like you were talking about Jonathan, but breathless is famous for it. So, oh yeah. Um, that's that's important to note. And of course, uh, Breathless and Tr- uh, Truffaut's The 400 Blows met with unexpected but large, very large international success, both critical and financial. And then starting with Le Petit Soldat in 1960, Godard's wife, Anna Karina, uh, would star in not just his, but many other directors' new wave films. I already mentioned she appears in like Cleo from 5 to 7 uh, with Agnes Varda. Uh, it's very easy to say that Anna Karina is like the face on screen of the French New Wave. Uh, not only does she have a very distinct look, but she's just in like a lot of the movies. And she these are also some of her most successful movies as well. So it's very easy to associate her with the movement, especially as like the on-screen movement. Um, yeah. his face. And eventually... The two of them would form a company, a production company called Anuchka Production Company. Uh, you, I believe you see it before the title in Perot Le Fou, although their marriage would not last, which is a common thread in director-actress marriages. Um, although Godard made about 15 films during his new wave period, and this would constitute his most influential period of work, um, he would continue working well beyond the 60s, um, for a period in the late 60s and early 70s, he created a series of political films with uh, Jean-Pierre Gorin under the Ziga Vertov group, expressing his political uh, ideologies, which were uh, very Marxist and very pro-revolutionary. Um, and this occupied, while not with this specific group, and it would take different, uh, different shapes and forms and structures, this would occupy a lot of his time for the next few decades. <laughs> Uh, in the 70s, Godard and uh, his life partner, uh, Anne-Marie Mielville, who he would actually be with for like decades until his death, um, founded Son Image, a Swiss production, video production and distribution company that created a handful of experimental films. Um, he would eventually return to occasionally making more traditional narrative fictions uh, films uh, with 1980s Every Man for Himself. Uh, and his films would become increasingly autobiographical um, and formalized over the next two decades, which is funny to me because it's kind of like he slowly uh, adapted some of the things that he decried in his earlier um, publications where he didn't like uh, stuff that was as autobiographical or as formalized. But age does that to a person. Uh, yeah. He would continue. I think to we're going to find more than projects. one contradiction throughout the French New Wave. Yeah, he would continue to work on various projects, often with experimental or unorthodox uh, structures uh, and various political motivations for the rest of his life. Uh, and he passed away in 2022, not that long ago. I actually what? remember this. Are happening. you kidding yeah. me? At his home, he was like 90 something in um, in Roll, Switzerland. Uh, through assisted euthanasia, which is legal in Switzerland, I found out. There you go. But Jonathan, what? That's a lot to talk about. Uh, but a quick, again, we're dealing with some very big personalities um, and and names uh, this in this series. So, Jonathan, what three Godard films from this period are we talking about? Well, we're going to start with Vivre Sa Vie, or My Life to Live, from 1962. Uh, directed by Jean-Luc Godard, and that goes for the rest, so I'm not going to say it anymore. Uh, and they're actually all also written by Jean-Luc Godard. So these are all directed and written by Jean-Luc Godard. Uh, this one is based on O N S la prostitution. Uh, You're the French by, guy, Jonathan. This, I know. this is your jam. I was actually thinking, <laughs> this, is, this is when it really hurts that I had one year of French and don't remember any of it, because... It would be really nice to actually watch these films and not uh, be looking at the bottom of the screen for a large portion of them Um, because there's there's so much visually to take in. But the it's also partially based on a uh, uh, the a novel Nana, 
um, which we'll get to that later. Yeah. Uh, the, the book by uh, Sakote is um, a more of an expose about prostitution in France, yeah. which apparently was legal. I didn't know that, but I think yeah, it there might was, still be legal. There's actually a, uh, there was a TV documentary about prostitution that is actually included in the Criterion Extras, uh, if anyone has Criterion Channel. Uh, and I think part of that, that documentary was part of his influence. And then he took inspiration for the character of Nana from the character of Nana by another famous uh, French story about a woman who tries to get into, uh, uh, become a stage star and ends up as a prostitute. Uh, anyway, the film stars Anna Karina and Sadie Rebot, Rebo, Rebo. Uh, cinematography by Raoul Cotard and music this is by a major name. Raoul Cotard is like the collaborator with uh, Godard during his French New Wave uh, period. Oh, there you go. Yeah, he's on all these. Um, and this one is music by Michel Legrand. And then we'll be talking about Band Apart or Band of Outsiders from 1964 based on the work of the same name by Dolores Hitchens, starring Anna Karina, Sammy Faye, and Claude Brassure, and cinematography by Raoul Cotard, and music by Michel Legrand again. Finally, we'll be talking about Piero Le Fou, uh, from 1965, or Pierre the Fool, I think, uh, directed by Jean-Luc Godard. It translated, it basically means sad clown. Yeah, well, P- Piero is the name of a sad clown character, a uh, uh, a, a classic sad clown character. He go- he's alongside of Harlequin, but he's always he always loses his love interest to Harlequin. Uh, so he's he's a he's a classic character, and and that's not the actual name of the character in the film, but it's kind of no, an illusion. But it's what his sort of girlfriend calls him all the time. Yeah. Which is uh, archetypically significant for the movie. Yeah. Based initially, at least, on Obsession by Lionel White, starring Anna Karina and Jean-Paul Bellamondo, uh, who we have seen in Breathless before. Cinematography by Raoul Cotard, and uh, music by Antoine Duhamel. Wow. And for this okay. series, Jonathan, I want to, uh, before we we dive into the individual breakdowns. I want to mention like one or two filmmakers um, from today uh, from our contemporary era that listeners might be more familiar with that uh, could serve as kind of like a point to look for the inspiration of this director's work. So people who Godard probably, well, definitely had a big influence on um, and the two I picked out for today were Quentin Tarantino and Wes Anderson. I see huge elements of both of their uh, their bodies of work being inspired by Godard. I would throw in uh, Shane Carruth, who basically cited Godard as like the influence for his super uh, unusual narrative structure in things like Upstream Color, uh, which we saw a lot in Breathless. It was very similar tonally. That's fair. All right, well, with all that, let's get into Vivre Sa Vie from 1962. Jason, set it up. My Life to Live from 1962. Nana Klein Frankenheim is a beautiful but wayward young Parisian who leaves her husband and infant child in pursuit of becoming an actress. Set across a dozen tableaus, her dreams turn sour as she turns to prostitution to make ends meet. All right, Jonathan, so... This is a pretty good introduction to, uh, if nothing else, uh, Godard's narrative structure, or lack thereof sometimes. Uh, but Vivre Savi is broken down into 12 tableaus, um, or episodes in the life of the main character, Nana. Um, and while they are all connected, they do not form a plot (laughs) stuff happens there's character development there's there's almost always character a significant amount of character development in godard films but is there a plot sometimes uh it's just not really something that seems to be super important to godard or maybe it's something that he was tired of being so formally important in the works that he criticized um but essentially we just get these 12 tableaus or glimpses 
into the life of of uh the main character they're in order um yeah but they don't always hold a lot of active plot typically they just hold a significant dis- discussion or uh a short event that happens in the life of this girl yeah and it's interesting because it 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 is a plot um and i would say it's more of a plot than we're going to see in Piero Le Fou, less of a plot than we see in the next film. But really what it is, is it's like, it's like if you chart interesting moments on a graph and then we just kind of pop in at the peaks. And yeah, it's but, almost but like it's, also, it's, it's being remembered. Like kind it's of. it's just like significantly remembered episodes, yes. Because some of them seem very important, um, and some of them seem almost like innocuous. Like so, so one or two of them are just like the a day in her life as a prostitute when she's already a prostitute, um, and nothing super significant seems to happen. It's just kind of like almost remembering as a collective, like this is what a day happened to be like when I was a prostitute. Um, where other ones like the first one where she leaves her husband is pretty significant. And of course you remember that. Um, so yeah. it's, it's interesting to see what's included and what's not. It almost, it's almost like a plot is implied and like the author, uh, knows what the plot is, but doesn't really give it to you. And I think that's why I put it as a bridge. Like, uh, I don't, so I haven't actually read it, but have you ever, are you familiar with the plot, the narrative device or literary device, I should say that William Golding uses in, um, the original text version of princess bride, Jonathan. Oh yes. Uh, that is. an yes, I've, I have read that text and it's incredible. Yeah. So he, cause he, he, he writes it like he's abridging another author's work. Yeah. Um, but there is no but original it's all fabricated. Yeah. He just, cuts out all of the all of what he considers to be the uninteresting parts and only gives us like a few interesting episodes that happen over the course of the Princess Bride story. Um, yeah. And that's very much what Godard's plots feel like to me. So that's why I use the word abridged. It's like if we're just getting like the selected bits here and there and they're selected for a reason. Um, right. And that's, that's kind of character development typically. Yeah. And that's that's where it breaks from something like the Princess Bride, which is pointedly a skipping to the action bits or the interesting bits or something like that. And as you said before, these are not always necessarily the interesting bits. Not that this is an, an action film per se, but I was reminded recently of the uh, um, the Aristotelian idea that plot reveals character. And what this film is is definitely a kind of a character study, but it it's, is. It's like you can you can chart the tableaus uh, against uh, Nana's character development, and they line up perfectly. Yeah, and but the thing is, is that it becomes incredibly participatory on the part of the audience because every time we jump to a new tableau, we are now slowly filling in the pieces of what happened in between the two. And so because part of the thing with this film is that Nana is she is incredibly internally conflicted and she's not even internally honest with herself. Uh, no, gosh, no. And so by leaving out by by leaving gaps in, we learn more about Nana than she even really knows about herself. So when she's talking about how she wants to get into movies and she wants to be an actress and stuff and then the f- you know, the first sign of trouble and she just starts stealing stuff and and turning into a prostitute. Like she's not really after anything in particular. But no. what's interesting is that what she is after, you know, what what her intention of becoming a movie star implies is that she wants attention, right? She wants to be seen. She wants to be known and, you know, for lack of a better term, loved by a lot of people. And that's exactly what she gets. She just gets kind of the easiest basest form of that desire. And we learn yeah. that that is the true desire as we move through and see what actions she settles with. And also 
how complacent she is about it because she's also a very uh, opaque character in a lot of ways. She doesn't have a lot of reaction. She kind of just goes with the flow. But again, based on what those little minute decisions are and those decisions that we don't see but are implied by where she ends up next. So she's in a diner and she wants to become an actress and she has an opportunity to do this photo shoot. And then in the next scene, she's picking up a guy because he's going to give her $4,000 to sleep with him. Uh, and she's totally just cool with that. So you're, you're realizing like slowly what her decisions are, but in those, uh, to use a phrase that we pulled a lot in the, um, the Ozu episode, those ellipses in the story. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that works. It's, it's a character study, but it's not a very, it's not an internal character study in the sense that we don't get that perspective. Um, it's almost like we're, for lack of a better phrase, like stalking Nana and just like checking up on her progress every now and then from a distance yep. and being like, oh, this is where she is now. Um, and a lot of that lines up too with the cinematography, which is good. That makes sense. And it's uh, something Godard would pay very close attention to because he's obsessed with those techniques. Um, a lot of the shots are almost voyeuristic in the sense yes. of like their indirectness. Like the opening shot of the movie is a very awkward over the shoulder shot um, that is almost like you're just staring at the back of Nana in this cafe for a long time, like eavesdropping actually, on this conversation. Um, Actually, Alex, that's not the first shot of the film. Is uh, it not? I think, What's the first shot of the movie? I think this is important because as we watch the opening credits, we see three portrait shots of Nana from each side of her face and straight on uh, in this super close up. The 4-3 the photography in this film is incredible and the way that it frames her isolated. There's also a video essay out there about how Godard isolates Nana's Yeah, she's character. often trapped by the architecture and framing of the shot. Yeah, uh, because she has kind of isolated herself from everyone else. Uh, but we see, so we see like the left side of her face, we see the front side of her face, we see the right side of her face as the credits are rolling and she's just sitting there staring off uh, into space. And then when we cut to the first scene, we see the last angle of her head that we have not seen, which is the back. Uh, and then that's kind of, yeah. And again, it's, there's, there's something really interesting that, that is, I, I'm still trying to come to terms with with the French New Wave, which is that they're all they all have a lot of of head knowledge. And yet for directors like Godard in particular, who was incredibly improvisational and he would just set up the camera where it felt right and just go for it. There's this weird disconnect between you go you go from studying someone like Hitchcock, who knew every single thing about the film before he started filming to let's just wing it every time we, we set up the camera uh, but he's got a lot of instincts that have been build up, built up. So it's hard to say he did this for this purpose. And it's more like we have to say something along the lines of he did this because in the moment it gives this feeling. And that's kind of what the French New Wave is exploring. What are the feelings that film can give you in, in nonverbal, uniquely cinematic ways? That's a pretty important uh, tension you referenced there. Um, that's pretty common throughout the whole French New Wave, but especially with Godard's work, because he's such an experimenter and rule breaker, um, like putting the camera it, in a, a shot where you're just going to stare at the back of your character's head for you can't five even really minutes. see your face in the mirror for like five minutes. Yeah, <laughs> it's it ends up being a great shot because of all the tension that it brings and all the interest it develops from the audience because the audience is like leaning forward to eavesdrop on the conversation. Like I said, it feels like you're sitting in the cafe with them, like eavesdropping on their conversation. Yeah. And that ends up being a very effective way to introduce yourself to this character. Um, but it's not typical and it's not something he would have learned from watching all of his older movies um, that he was obsessed with. So there's this interesting tension between how referential and reverential the French New Wave directors are towards um, the great auteurs that they appreciate from the past and how 
willing they are to break the rules in an effort to, I guess, in their eyes, push cinema forward and invent a new cinema that is going to shake something up. Because they are, make no mistake, attempting to shake something up. They do not like the current state of modern French cinema, and they very much wanted to change it. And yeah. that's what they're after here. So that's why you get inveterate rule breakers like Godard, who's like, I'm going to try something different and just does it because that wasn't done beforehand. But they were also making movies for next to no money with no big investors, at least at the beginning. Um, and so they could. Um, yeah. And they were good enough to get away with it. Yeah. Two things to bring up on that. I think I think that the the French New Wave is the epitome of the phrase, you have to know the rules to break the rules. They spent 10 years, they literally wrote the book on the rules, and then yeah, they went nerds. out and broke every single one of them. Um, yeah, Rule-breaking nerds. Yeah. There's even, for our next episode, I'm going to break out the uh, the Hitchcock Truffaut book, um, which became basically the definitive filmmaking guide for a lot of the American New Wave. Uh, but You mean two episodes from now? Oh, I thought Truffaut was next. I don't know who's next. No, yet. Romer's next. Oh, okay. Um, well, then I have two weeks. I have two months to read the Truffaut book again. Um, but the other thing that I want to, uh, I don't want to let slip past me is your idea that there's there's a voyeurism. There's this idea of us stalking um, Nana, which is important because I think part of what the film does in again in this participatory way of character development and character reveal which that word is important because a lot of it harkens to towards the very end of the film when the young man is reading from Edgar Allan Poe uh the oval portrait which I believe is a horror story by Poe where a painter is obsessed with painting this portrait of his wife that captures every detail of her and who she is and and uh, but in the process, he drains all life from her and basically transfers it to the portrait. So by the time he finishes it, her she's actually dead. And there's kind of that uh, that element to the whole film in that Nana has at some point been, again, her desire is to be seen and known and loved. And at some point, she has been seen and known and loved to death. To <laughs> it, It's all been misdirected and misguided and it is ultimately her downfall. Yeah, it's very much much a, a monkey's paw wish. Um, but, but we have been seeing her, and we've seen her from all these different angles. And now I, I do want to point out that the film is very tasteful, if I could say that, in its portrayal of prostitution. So it's not it's not a explicit. Um, yeah, it's not gritty. Revealing, but it's like. Again, with that, we've seen every side of her face at the very beginning, and then we see different sides of her personality throughout the film. So we are complicit in this consumption of her and who she is to the point where there's nothing left of her. Yeah, one of the recurring shots, too, is of her uh, her portrait, her face, yeah. uh, framed by a window. And they're almost all, like, super lovely shots. Like, they always grab my attention. Because the the backlighting mixed with uh, the bounce lighting on her face is just beautiful and expertly done. Um, but it, it frequently either opens or closes uh, one of the tableaus uh, is this the shot of her framed like a portrait. And we're basically seeing that portrait updated over the course of the movie. Um, but yeah, it very much is... Fe- it, it, for a book based on an expose, it very much feels like we're watching an expose about this woman. Um, But it also feels like she hasn't really consented to be in the expose, even though um, all that attention is something that she would desire. And again, that story of Edgar Allan Poe about the painter who has painted his wife to death through capturing every detail of her also becomes, it's almost a prophetic autobiography of Jean-Luc Godard and his relationship with Anna Karina, and the fact that every time he makes a film with her, there's kind of an interesting aspect of their relationship mixed up into it in yeah. a way that kind of ill fates the relationship ultimately. They did not have a great personal relationship. Um, yeah. I know she 
has uh, accused Godard of abuse. I don't know what kind, and I don't know the details, but it sounds like their relationship was incredibly rocky, um, but very productive from a creative standpoint, uh, yeah. which I wish that was the only version of that in, in film history, but it's not. I also want to point out how influential, again, Anna Karina is, but I got big vibes of her off of her character in this movie that reminded me a lot of Mia Wallace from Pulp Fiction. Um, and yes, I don't I think, think that's it's a isolated to this movie as well either. I think it's almost all Anna Karina and Godard uh, films that could be some aspect of Mia Wallace. But the hairstyle, I think, the is hairstyle. directly pulled from this film. Yes, yeah. That, and then, of course, uh, there. Uh, there's one in this movie. There's one in each movie, I believe, a random dancing uh, scene uh, that yeah. again feels very Pulp Fiction. Yes, I would say the one in Band Apart probably more Pulp Fiction than the one in Verve Savi, but the one in Verve Savi is also very interesting, and I think maybe maybe a little better integrated than Band Apart. Yeah, Band Apart is is, is really interesting. We'll we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> it's really we'll choppy get to that in a minute. <laughs> Yeah, although I okay, so a few few other things to point out about this film is I think there's there is really good use of uh subtextual elements. So, for example, one of the first things that happens is right after she has this breakup scene with her husband. Well, Jonathan, um, you know if you just learned French, you could turn the subtext off, right? <laughs> you can't turn the subtext off, Alex. Um <laughs> You guys say that while smoking a cigarette and drinking like a black cup of coffee in a cafe. That's, that's and dancing. one of the rules. Yeah, so after she she finishes this this random and super uh, poorly explained breakup with her husband, uh, they go and they play pinball, which seems like a super random kind of thing, right? Until you one realize that- One last game of pinball before but, I abandon my husband and child. Yes, okay, you did pick that up, because I wasn't sure. Yeah, no, no, there's a lot of stuff in, like that that's just like kind of like almost a throwaway line where he's like, do you want to see pictures of the baby? And she's like, no, I don't think I want to. Um, yeah. It's like, oh, she has a kid. <laughs> yeah, um, she's like, I, I just cheated on you because you're boring. I'd have done it anyway, whatever. I don't think we should be together anymore. And he's like, but what about the baby? She's like, he looks more like you than me anyway. Eh, whatever. That's all of that stuff is there is no bit of dialogue that is unintentional in a Godard movie or a throwaway line. Every bit of it reveals character, which yeah. is one of the chief rules of dialogue, especially since people it just reminds me so much of people struggling with dialogue in the early days of sound. But dialogue is there to reveal character and advance plot. I still remember right. my uh, playwriting teacher <laughs> explaining to us that we every single line of dialogue had to reveal character and advance plot and me being like, oh, my God, that's hard. But when it's done well, it's really good. And Verve Savi and actually all of Godard's work is typically a pretty good example of that. There's maybe some parts that get a bit rambly in Perot LeFou. I think they intentionally get a little bit rambly. But yeah. Verve Savi, in terms of like character being revealed through subtext and dialogue, is well done and just tight across the board. Like, no lost effort. Which brings me back to the game of pinball, because ultimately, in that moment, she's given herself the first step towards her life of prostitution in which she is bounced around from man to man until she falls down the hole and uh, gets caught in the middle of the two warring pimp gangs. Never get caught between pimp gangs. So she literally, yeah, she literally becomes the pinball. What do you, what do you, hey, that's a good point. What do you think about the fact that so many characters have uh, their mouths hidden while they talk? So is, yeah, but it's not just mouths. It's, there are there are a lot of instances where faces are hidden and so we get that most blatantly i think in the first scene where we're staring at the back of their heads for a while but then there's also the scene where the pimp raul which also mm -hmm. it's kind of strange that her husband's name is paul and then her pimp's name is raul and they're just they're like one letter apart um but raul is there and he's you know gonna 
he doesn't really have to convince her, but he's there to basically say, hey, come join my posse or whatever. I don't know what you call pimps people. Uh, but oh. he, uh, but the camera shifts over and then suddenly Nana's face is being completely covered by Raul's, the back of Raul's head. So again, we're just staring at the back of their heads and no, uh, and n- n- not seeing Nana's face. And, yeah. uh, so it, it is this interesting mix of a, a revealing and an obscuring at the same time, which is kind of, again, I think kind of has a, uh, implications for a story about prostitution, which is a revealing of oneself without actually revealing oneself in the way that sexuality is designed for. It's like a, a hidden revealing, which is a, a paradox, but it's kind of it's, the paradox it's a, of prostitution. It's a superficiality. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of that has to just do with like that that recurring theme of of obscuring Nana and not real like trapping her in the frame or um keeping her opaque to the audience and not revealing what she's fully thinking at any point in time. Um heck, I think the most honest scene she has is probably the one where she just talks to the random old dude in the cafe. Yes. So yeah, I I do love that scene. But before we get there, I want to mention the scene, um, uh, the pool hall dancing scene. But not for the dancing, which is what everyone focuses on in that scene. But I think the most important part of that scene is is where she meets the young man, and we have no yeah, idea she meets what the funny guy. Yeah, I don't, I don't know who the funny guy was. I don't know why her pimp is hanging out with these guys in the first place. They seem like absurdly innocent, both the young man and the funny guy, um, especially given the context. But, but the young man, the one thing he does in that scene, he's kind of oblivious to her or he's trying to not, like he knows that, you know, the people that are there are kind of shady. He's, he seems like he doesn't want to be involved with whatever prostitution talk is happening uh but then she asks she asks for a cigarette which she asks everyone for a cigarette throughout the film uh and and everyone kind of ignores her and then he leaves in the background of the shot and he comes back and gives her a cigarette and kind of in that moment he's the only one who has actually heard her and understood what she wanted and in a way that she doesn't even like he he has gone and and done what she asked f- just out of the sake of being nice. And that's the only time anyone does that for her. And I think that's why she doesn't seem to be affected by it then. But again, through our process of uh, ellipsis and deduction, the fact that we see them together again towards the end and we we infer that they have begun a relationship, I think that's what starts that is the fact that he sees her and he he hears her and tries to understand what she wants in a way that no one else does. Yeah. Yeah. No, no most people just treat, uh, Nana as kind of like nothing. Like, when well, she's, she's there, she is a tool for what they want. That's literally what she is. Yeah. 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 She's, she's just an object to them. Um, so yeah, it is rare that anybody actually acknowledges her outside of that dichotomy over the course of the movie. Um, but yeah, it's de- it's not emphasized for re- for a reason. Yeah, yeah, but but it's a really it's a really important thing. One thing I do want to point out, um, and it comes back to the uh, the like nerdy obsession with film techniques is Godard's use of mise en scène or mise en scène, um, mise en scène, mise en scène. Um, however the French say it, I don't know, but it, it literally just means what's in the frame and what's not in the frame. And yeah. it, it kind of comes back to the art of, uh, shot framing and production design. And, uh, there's a lot of locations. what's not in the frame in this film. There's a lot of what's not in the frame. And we've talked about that a lot with the framing, um, and what's shown and what's purposely obscured. Uh, but this is a more mundane thing. That's almost just a background. Uh, it's almost like an Easter egg that you can pick up if you want to pick it up, but it's not necessary to pick it up. But it happens a lot in his movies, and it just shows that he's always thinking about um, what is in the shot and what's not in the shot. And like we talked about with the lack of wasted dialogue uh, or, or the 
absence of wasted dialogue. Like every line has a purpose. It's very similar with stuff that's in on the screen for Godard. Uh, even when his shots seem really obtuse, normally there's a an attempt or a point to have them make sense. Um, but one thing that he is good with using uh, a bit cheekily is his uh, production design. For instance, the commercial text in uh, in the very last tableau where uh, our main character finally bites the dust, um, which is happens outside the restaurant de studio, um, which very much means like film studio. So in, in that sense, like the performance of our character um, who's been trying to be a film actress or somebody who's paid attention to has finally come to an end and it's time to hit the restaurant after work. Yeah. Now that the show's over. Also, there's a nod to uh, Jules and Jim it, as they, they're driving by and they see the movie theater for uh, one of Francois Truffaut's big films. Uh, and so it's like there's a little cross-pollination within the film itself. Yeah. Um, Actually, speaking of the movie theater, um, the scene where they we just watch like a whole scene from uh, Joan, of Joan of Arc is wild. Like the idea that he just put a whole movie scene in there. Yeah. I mean, it's important to like who uh, Nana is as a character. Um, I was trying to figure that out because I'm trying to decide if it's more important to Godard or if it's because that's that's again one of those inconsistencies in her character is she's very affected by this character of Joan of Arc who is kind of you know she's she's one of France's kind of patron saints she's she's hailed as as this person who did the who kind of held held to her highest ideal unto death basically and it's kind of the opposite of what Nana's character ends up doing. She's very affected by it, but she kind of seems to not have the power to enforce that in herself, or she just doesn't have the ideal. She doesn't have the uh, God-given calling to aspire to, and so her death is much more uh, base and literally just, you know, thrown thrown on the street to the dogs. I mean, I guess I, I saw more similarities I saw um, a woman who got burned up and used um, by a bunch of men around her uh, on screen and in Nana's life. Um, yeah. You know, I don't think... Although you can't say it was... It, it was not involuntary in Nana's case. I mean, that's true, but it's also not like... I guess I guess I'm trying to look at it more from like why Nana would find it so so sympathetic. I mean, on the one hand, like Nana does dream of being a movie actress. So in the course of that scene, we could just be seeing that character on screen play out like Yeah. She is kind of the penultimate actress. Uh yeah. that, and especially that scene is the is one of one of the pinnacles of film acting. Yeah, that's what Nana wants is to be that famous and that good and to have everybody pay attention to her and weep at her performance and, and, uh, something along that line. Um, but in the pursuit of that, that's not what she finds. She finds the, um, the unceremonious death, um, and being used up and essentially sacrificed for somebody else's, uh, war at the very end. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So it is, it is, but also like you have a point that it is a bit railroaded into the movie because Godard's just a big film nerd. And he was like, this yeah. is a really good movie. And it's, it's, it's reminiscent of like what's going on in my movie. So I got to put it in there. Um, and in terms of this being a pretty early French New Wave film, one of the things that, again, one of the Criterion video essays was talking about is the idea that putting that scene in the film, you know, apart from its, uh, internal relevance it kind of gives this element of gravitas to the idea of film study and film reverence to a, a broader public so now it's Godard saying you know it's okay to watch and like films and think about them deeply and not just uh, go to films for mere 
entertainment. And so then he's kind of broadcasting that love for film to his audience, whatever that is. And then it just kind of becomes this ripple effect. So there is there is kind of a, a meta element to the inclusion of that scene. Yeah. Yeah. No, there definitely is. Um, but that's also makes sense for uh, the group that was making it. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, as we move on to Band of Outsiders, I I, I just want to point out the last thing in that this film, with all the things we've been talking about, and even though it is still pretty low budget, it feels very structured. Like, even though the the framing and the the filming is... The 12 tableaus really help. The the fact that it's like there's going to be 12 episodes and then they're numbered gives it some solid structure. And every frame is very uh, tight, even though it's it was shot up, it was set up pretty quickly. It's still, you know, they're beautiful compositions. It's well edited. It's, you know, got a lot of, uh, you know, it, it feels solid. Whereas, like we talked about back when we talked about Breathless, it's kind of frantic and it's all over the place and it's got a lot of uh, kind of dynamic energy in the the framing and the editing and stuff like that. And we're going to see that again in Band of Outsiders. And I think it's really interesting that that Breathless and Band of Outsiders kind of frame this film because this one feels much more kind of uh, planted on its feet than these two. So as we go into Band of Outsiders, it gets a little uh, unhinged. Well, every every Godard movie is a little different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's a little, it's, um, it's not quite like Wes Anderson where you watch it and you're like, oh, I know who made this. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's, it's, it's a little different. You know them by their titles because there's only like 12. But, um, but yeah. Anyway, Jason, take it away. Band of Outsiders from 1964. The young, optimistic Odile meets the sulky Franz and his best friend, the brash Arthur, in English class. The two men are wannabe thieves, and Odile has a lead on the money being kept by the man renting out her aunt's spare room. The trio strike out with foolhardy ambition to score it big. All right, Jonathan. Um, this movie really kind of... I, I, I wanted to start off with stuff that was more unique to the movie, but I feel like this is maybe a good place to start the discussion. I felt this movie felt like a blend of Bottle Rocket and Ferris Bueller's Day Off to me. I... Yes, I, I was hide. feeling a lot of Ferris Bueller. Like even the even the scene where they're running in the in the in the museum. It's Especially like the, that scene. It's exactly the scene from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. And like it's got, the it's the boy girl boy dynamic. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And the the one boy's super brash and bold and the other boy's like moody and mopey. Yeah. Ferris Bueller I, is is I, I can't imagine that there's no band of outsiders because the, the three are a band of outsiders literally outside the school where they're supposed to be running around town doing whatever. Yeah. Not, I not mean, like the, but the connection's so close that you could we could almost do like a Sam Rice and some with uh with Band of Outsiders and Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Like it's it's crazy close. Um at least in the character formula. But Ferris Bueller, I guess, doesn't get shot and killed at the end of Ferris Bueller's yeah. Day Off. Less crime. Le- um, Slightly less crime. They are true so the whole film. Yeah, so your, uh, your combination is Bottle Rocket and Ferris Bueller. My combination was thinking In Cold Blood and Roman Holiday. <laughs> Those were my... Roman uh, Holiday, I totally see. In yeah. Cold Blood, I kind of see, but like... I think it's just because... Uh, uh, what's his face? The... Uh, Arthur, he's just, he's like psychopathic. He's, oh, he, he is, he's nuts. Yeah, no. He's got this no. like really cold blooded air about him. And I think it, yeah. it was just that, that sense of unease that's like underneath this otherwise really freewheeling uh, kind of a film. Cause it, it yeah. is that weird blend of uh, it's, it's lighthearted and it's, uh, Happy go lucky, but it has a real element of danger and grittiness underneath it all. Yeah, especially in the very end. Uh, it, it's weird because it's a movie that's a crime movie, but 99% of it is not about crime. It's really just about. It's, it's, it's the a same thing as Breathless. Study. Almost it's, all it's of Godard's work like breaks down to being a, a character study. Um, and this is a triple character study with our two guys and our one girl. 
Um, and most of the time is spent exploring those characters. I will say as crazy as Arthur felt, I started to just barely get him by the end of the movie. By the end of the movie, I was like, oh, okay, your uncle's crazy, probably beat you up on the regular and threatens your life. Um, and you clear, like, what, again, this is the film nerd in Godard, but our, our two boys uh, really like American movies, especially Westerns, it seems. Yeah. Um, they reference uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid uh, in one of the opening scenes. Uh, but so the the impression I get from Arthur is that he's he's abused, poor, uh, and finds refuge in this idea of like this noble outlaw kind of character who's so hard on the outside um, that he saw in in the movie theaters and is kind of just like acting out what he sees in the theaters as Alex, kind of a way to cope. Yes, uh, Butch Cassidy didn't come out until five years after this movie. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, but they had to have been like some kind of like. I think it. I think they were. I think they reenacted Billy the Kid. Um, I don't know which film oh, was they Billy were the kid? It might have referencing, been. but I think they said Billy the Kid. Anyway, but no, it it very much has a Butch Cassidy kind of feel. Like Butch Cassidy yes. is almost another band of outsiders. Uh, yes. So that's that's really interesting. But you said that, and I was thinking. Either that film came out immediately before this one, or it wasn't even out yet. But it, it, yeah. there is a very much a kind of spiritual connection there. But yeah, we got we've got the 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 kid who because make no mistake, they all act like they're adults, but they're all just kids pretending to be grown ups. Yeah. Um, we we've got the the one guy who's acting super hard, even though I'm pretty sure he isn't. Um, we've got the one kid who's Mister Mopey Moperson. Um, over there, who's too sad to do anything? He just kind of follows his friend around. Um, and then we've got the overly optimistic girl who is heading over hills in love with this guy who acts like a little cool. Um, okay, but Let's also talk about is that. acting super naive. So this is this is the one thing that uh, is kind of you kind of have to take it for granted because there's. There's this implication, I guess, that uh, the one guy, Franz. So Franz is the handsome guy, and uh, Arthur is the is the cold blooded guy that she's in love with. But it's like Franz set them up, and they had never met before, and then they just decided that they were going to be in love immediately. Uh, and then, but it sounds like I, something. I have kids no did. idea what was going on, but it was like, oh. Great. Thanks for introducing us. Now let's go do some crime. And well, be in love. yeah, I think the the because the reason that Franz originally introduced um, brought Arthur to the class wasn't anything to do with love. It was that he had already heard from yeah. Odile and a Karina that there was that her her aunt's tenant, uh, a room letter. Uh, had a bunch of money tucked away in his room. And so he and his friend were already had an idea of that. They were going to be like these super cool outlaws and rob and steal and stuff. Um, they're playing at being thieves, right? That's what keeps bringing me back to Bottle Rocket. Is like they're not actually yeah. criminals. They're just playing at it. Um, yeah. And so that's why he brings Arthur in. Now, from the impression I got was that Franz already had a, a crush on Odile, but he didn't do anything about it. And Arthur was like, I'm going to get one over my friend. And so immediately, like, uh, like flirted with Odile. And I guess it's that thing where, like, you know, young woman who may, may not, not have ever been flirted with before is like, oh, this is great. And falls for, like, the first bold person who approaches her. Um, and yeah, Franz is kicking right. himself in the corner and then just mopes like the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. Uh, until the end. And yeah, so this is also one that's interesting because Viva Savi was not narrated, but this film is narrated. And that's something that we should bring up. because Viva Savi did have portions that felt narrated. They, right. It wasn't well, officially narrated, but it, it had portions that felt like they were narrated. Narrative. Yeah, so we have the section where the pimp is driving her through town and he's explaining all the rules of prostitution, which is very much 
pulled straight from the prostitution documentary. So it's like when you're reading a, a Victor Hugo novel and he just goes off for a few chapters about how the sewer system in Paris works. Um, that's basically you get what it. You're a sewer nerd. Move on. Um, but yeah, in uh, in Band of Outsiders, there's there's a voiceover, and a few other good art films, there's voiceover. There's there's a really interesting use of voiceover in Alphaville, but here it's kind of playing on those uh, themes from the American films because this is uh, one of the things that we're we're going to see is that these films, a lot of these early films from Godard, are directly pulled from American genre films. And so whenever he, again, kind of playing on these impulses that he has, but he's falling back to conventions that have been set up in American film. So he's kind of winging it so they feel very raw, but there's still a lot of noir uh, technique that is just kind of inherent in the way that these films are made. And so there's that noir voiceover uh, by Franz throughout the whole thing. And then when we get to Piero Lafou, we get Godard saying uh, he's getting a little more angsty. He's got a little more personal life troubles. There's a little more political turmoil. And he starts saying, I've done the films that that the Americans made. People liked them. I'm going to start I'm going to start changing things again. So it's kind of this constant process. There's actually a quote. There's a uh, video again on Criterion of c compiled clips of Godard talking about his own work. And he has he has this strain where every time he makes a film that becomes popular, he gets a little more annoyed because he's like, I work best when the audience doesn't trust me and I have to like work hard to get them on my side. When they go into a film already trusting me, I feel bored. And so I have to reinvent whatever my genre is. And so here we're still uh, seeing so some of those. So he's an edgy kid too. So after he finishes his, uh, his nerd club, he goes to Hot Topic to, to process his <laughs> angst about yeah. being too popular. Yeah, he has to, you know, uh, dye his hair black and the whole bit. Everyone um, thinks they get me, but they don't really but yeah, understand. There's, there's, there's very much a surrealist spirit in that, too, because that's what uh, Louis Bunuel talked about, where he was like, we just wanted to make films that would piss people off. And then everyone loved them. And it made me so mad. <laughs> well, don't make good films then. <laughs> if you yeah. don't want people to like your movies, then don't make good movies. Stop it. It's funny because people think that they can't break convention because then no one will go see their film or whatever. But at some mm -hmm. point people are so thirsty for innovation that even trash that looks different from the mainstream will get hailed uh, and, and picked up immediately. But no one is uh, there's, there's just becomes these long stretches it's where no one's brave enough to make anything different. Anyway, all that was to say that at this point in band apart, Godard is still falling back on many, um, American genre tropes and so we have that voiceover uh, and yet even though there are so many of those tropes in there just the scrappy nature of the film and the fact that Godard hasn't really planned it out uh, makes it feel very different than a typical noir this is not Sunset Boulevard by any means or Maltese Falcon or whatever else but it's just taking the idea of that and putting it on top of his his film no, because those movies are plot driven <laughs> right? and, and with with character development happening as like a result of the plot. This is uh, character driven with plot happening as a result of the character. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that's a pretty good way of looking at it. Honestly, like it's it's a very good technique of filmmaking. It's what we would call um, low concept, right? Is that the plot isn't the forefront. It's not the main idea. Um, it's technically there, but <laughs> this one probably like has the two. most plot of the three because there's actually, uh, a goal and steps taken to achieve that goal. And then I what happens as a result, the plot in Perot, once we get to Perot, cause like you spend the whole movie thinking there's not a plot and then you get to the end and you're like, there's been a plot the whole time. <laughs> and you're yeah. just like, Oh, okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, the plot like peeks its head through a couple times, but every time it does, you're like, what is happening? Yeah. Oh, so what do we think about the dancing scene in Band of Outsiders? Because it's like the signature dancing scene when it comes to Godard movies. Dances. It's probably the most popular and the most well known. And it's just through it's the three dancers doing it's the three characters 
doing a routine that they somehow know ahead of time um, where they just kind of dance in a square more or less doing the same moves in this cafe. But the whole time it's happening and it's not the best dancing. I I want to be very clear about that. Um, There we get the internal viewpoint of all of these characters. We, we actually hear the voiceover uh, narrator tell us what's going on in each of the characters heads as they do this little dance. And it's one very character revealing two oddly entrancing and yeah. three completely unconventional. Yeah. And so again, that's that's part of that use of the voiceover. And by the end we learn that the voiceover is Franz. Uh but yeah, it it basically kind of it hammers home a lot of the uh uh what we've already kind of been discovering uh in a very implied sort of way like based on what the narrator says that they're thinking, we get just a picture of who they are in general. Uh, And, but there's also, there's also a lot of rule breaking in that scene too. First of all, the camera is just static. So we're just watching this scene unfold in real time, like a stage play, but also it goes in and out from the music and then the music cuts and it'll be silent, which is something that happened a lot in Viva Savi too, that I forgot to mention is Godard uses. Godard loves to just randomly cut music. He just cuts t- cuts the sound out, and then we're suddenly in a silent film. Uh, it's which is it's a good way to grab the audience's attention, but yeah. I will say it's one of his techniques that is less effective to me as I think as he seems to use it. Yeah, I think I I'm always fascinated by that technique, and I feel like it is it is very underutilized in modern filmmaking and i always think about it in relation to 2001 and gravity where gravity was all about isolation and i think the tagline was something about the the silence or something but there was never a moment in that film where there was not a musical score or something happening whereas in 2001 there's that extended sequence of the guy going out to get uh the body of his friend and all you're hearing is him breathing through his helmet and you're just surrounded by silence for an ex- a really really long time uh and so i i love it when silence is used like that and i think godard uses it a little uh it's a little on the nose in a lot of points and it's not really like it does a particular thing but again this is these filmmakers experimenting with what effect is this going to have if we cut all the music and we just focus on the voiceover for this moment? So it's less integrated. It makes the voiceover, which is already non-diegetic, even less diegetic by just completely pulling us out of the film except for the visuals. Uh, so like, it's hard to say if it's a good or a bad thing. It's just a really interesting choice that he made, I think. I Yeah, that's, that's the impression I got is that it's him experimenting. And when he when and and here's here's where I come down on this. Godard does a lot of experimenting, and a lot of it works very well because one, he's built up that instinct, and two, he's done essentially a lot of research, and he just knows it. Um, and then he adds practice on top of that, and he winds up being a good filmmaker. But not all of the stuff he does works, and sometimes when he cuts the music, it's just a little awkward and weird. There's a whole scene literally about just that music cutting in and out in Perot Le Fou about a guy who thinks he's going crazy because the music keeps cutting in and out. Um, but I, I, while it's tempting to say that it always has meaning, I think sometimes he's just seeing if he can get meaning out of it. And so I think the use of it in Band Apart during the voiceover uh, sequence while it's dancing is actually the best use of it that I've seen across his movies because it's... Um, it's it's grabs your attention and it's almost like in Monty Python where they say and now for something completely different like it snaps you to it's like okay listen up now don't get entranced by the dancing we're about to tell you something and it kind of gives you that that idea that it's being interrupted and it, it makes the awkwardness of the scene feel a little more purposeful I think the worst use of it is in Perot Le Fou when they're stealing the car (laughs) off of the 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 pump rack thing at the gas station. I 
hate the use of it during that scene. I don't think it works at all. I think it's a bold attempt, but I don't think it works the way it's intended and just takes me out of the scene entirely. Because that's that's kind of honestly how you know whether something does or doesn't work. Is like, oh, does this engross me more in the scene? Does this create extra meaning in the scene? Does it add to what's going on? Or does it do the opposite? Does it take me out? Uh, does it interrupt what's going on? Um, I have vice versa. Thing. So that's kind of where I come down on that idea of him cutting music randomly uh, for silences. Sometimes it works great, but decidedly not all the time. And it is very tempting because these directors are so good at what they do. And they're kind of held up as like the pinnacle of like film nerds turned directors to be like, oh, everything they do is amazing. But also we have to be honest when something doesn't work for you. And sometimes the music cutting thing doesn't work for me. Okay, well, how about the uh, the ending of this film where everything culminates? Oh, in, all uh, the plot happens in like 10 minutes at the very yeah, end. All the plot happens. It suddenly turns into a crime film after it's been a, a Roman holiday for an hour and a half. I will say, even though they they he promised a crime, he promised a heist, and a heist happens at the end, I think there's some cleverly written twists. Um Okay, like, yeah, uh, I want to clarify that too because some I wasn't completely sure about some of it. Like I th again, this is and this is kind of like the the child existing in Verve Savi. A lot of it is just heavily implied, and the hints are there, and you can figure it out um, if you want to figure it out. But also, I don't think there's one interpretation that can be correct because we have a limited amount of evidence. The way I saw it was that they did the whole heist, but Arthur had already stolen the money because he knew that uh, his uncle was going to come take it and hit it in the doghouse. Um, so he he went back to go get the money and protect it from his uncle, and that did not work out for him. Yeah, but there's another thing where at the very end, so there's a lot of stuff that happens, and the entire the entire thing happens in a wide shot so it's confusing because there's the woman who lives there they've locked up in the safe and she mm -hmm. died she was she wearing a white to die. So, okay she pretends to die that's the thing because then yeah someone in a white <laughs> in a white robe comes out at the end and i was like okay so like they didn't check well enough <laughs> uh yeah because then yeah she's She's there, and then the shootout happens, and then the other guy, the the renter whose money it is, comes back too, and it's just everything yeah. just happens, and I'm like, who is who? It's a wide shot, and oh, I also got the impression that the renter and the aunt were kind of in it together a little bit. I don't entirely know what their plan was, but it felt like they kind of caught wind of like something's up with Odile. <laughs> we see her yeah, talking. Yeah, she was to this. not very sneaky. No, she's not sneaky. None of them are. They're kids pretending to be thieves. They're yeah. not good at this. Um, so it almost felt like they were kind of like trying to do a, a double thing where they tried to throw the kids off essentially by pretending to fall for it. But actually, they had moved the money already. So maybe they put the money in the doghouse and Arthur just happened to find it before they could they could get back. But also Arthur runs into um, his uncle and they shoot each other. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that scene is kind of cool, kind of like a really stupid death, but also kind of cool in the way he just keeps walking at him, um, even after he's being shot. So I guess Arthur gets to live out his his fantasy of being a really cool on screen hard character who dies like he's in a movie. Yeah, no, it was very it was very fitting. And even just the hectic hecticness of the scene kind of puts us in the same mode as uh, Franz and Odile who are watching from a distance. And so we're watching from a distance too, kind of creating this triangle of observation. And uh, so so then we we are fully with them uh, as we're just kind of viewing this and then by the end when we see Franz and Odile traveling to America on a steamer we realize they they are who the film was about uh right it wasn't really about Arthur Arthur was just kind of a crazy impediment to the actual love story which was happening behind the scenes Franz the uh the dreamer who during the dance scene is thinking about all the 
stars and the love in the world or whatever whatever it was is like basically yeah, his he head is like constantly really in the clouds answer for this scene uh and uh and odile who's just yeah concerned about how much attention she's getting uh personally and uh mm-hmm. doesn't really care where it's coming from again kind of a nana thing again yeah 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 that's a similar thread um yeah the end honestly the end the way the 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 uh the crime kind of wraps up in like all these connected wide shots is one of the things that reminds me a lot of Wes Anderson with all these characters suddenly who you've seen over the course of the film suddenly interacting all at once in this big chaotic scene that plays out in a wide shot it's like oh yeah you know no, that that is Wes Anderson all right i can see um, that yeah for sure um and even just the two characters running off together uh because of love is something that happens frequently in Wes Anderson movies. Yeah. And of course, again, I, I haven't seen every Godard film from this period, from his uh, new wave period. I've seen a few of them. Um, but someone dies at the end of this one. Every single Godard movie I've seen from this period so far, someone dies at the end of it. Um, yeah. And someone dies at the end of this one too. One of the main characters, not just a random person. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Always at least one of the main characters if not the main character. Um, although they don't die as uh, explosively as in the <laughs> next movie. So, Jason, uh, set us up for Pierrot Le Fou from 1965. Pierrot Le Fou from 1965. Ferdinand is bored of middle-class life in Paris, finding it empty and meaningless. So he leaves his wife and children and runs away with his ex-girlfriend, Marianne, who is being chased by deadly OAS gangsters. The two set off on a crime spree from Paris to the Mediterranean, but will any of it bring happiness and meaning to Ferdinand's life? Alex, I have a confession. Yeah? Uh, it's been a while, but this is, this is a reminder to me that when we're doing foreign films, foreign art house films, I, uh, Cannot watch them late at night when I'm a little bit sleepy because sometimes I just I just can't remember what the heck happened if it doesn't have a plot and I'm sleepy. No, I I've watched Perot Le Fou like three times over the course of my life and I can't remember what happens in it like ever. Okay, I, I wouldn't because it was also that. it was also one that I had to rent and so I didn't have the luxury of going back and like skimming through all the scenes to put them back in order in my memory. So you're gonna have to help me out through this because this one is so this has been described, I think, very accurately as pop art. Oh, you have that in here. It's too. pop art. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Pop art is a very good way of describing it. Um, it, one, it's very notable that it's the first color film we're talking about today. Yeah. I don't remember if it's the first color film in Godard's Over, but like it's it's a very no. hefty use of Technicolor and very bright color in general. Um, yeah. And it, it from that, that angle of pop art might be a pretty good way to digest the movie because there's a lot of stuff that feels like it should have really deep significance. Um, and you can attach significance to things in this movie, but there's also just not uh, a lot. That, like in terms of like very grandiose themes, like there does it doesn't really develop into anything. It might be like a little bit about rejecting consumerism and how like futile that effort might be. Although that seems like something that's more built into Ferdinand's character and his personal motivation more than anything else than the wider sense of the movie. Uh, Cause it's, again, it ends up just being a character study, mostly about Ferdinand. Um, yeah. This guy who thinks of himself as being very intellectual, very smart, very anti-consumerist. And he gets sick and tired of his middle-class life in, in Paris. He thinks it's vapid and empty of meaning. And so he decides to run off and start this life of uh of crime and being a philosopher on a desert island off the mediterranean coast crime um, and philosophy yeah but it it ends up not being as fulfilling or satisfying as he thinks it is now as to the details of what happens dude your guess is as good as mine yeah. like technically there's this plot about how um his his ex-girlfriend at the start of the movie marianne um, is who he runs away with and he's 
kind of with her, kind of secretly not with her over the course of the movie. That's confusing as well. Um, yeah. But they she's she's of, like a hardened criminal who kills people by stabbing them in the neck with scissors. And that just yeah. kind of happens and uh, is not shown or explained. There's so much that's not explained in this movie. And, and we talked about how like some plot details and character details are implied in previous movies or like the use of ellipsis in Vir Savri, Savi. Uh, but this is like it taken to an extreme where it's like almost like, like there's almost no point in, in trying to connect the dots. Like you can kind of do it. Like yeah. there's technically this plot apparently that's been happening the whole time where they're being hunted by OAS, which is like an extreme far right political party in France, uh, terrorists, um, over the course of the movie and that's who they fight you you recognize them basically because you see the same people that they end up clashing with over the course of the movie um and also i feel like this doesn't spoil anything i feel like this is an impossible movie to spoil um but it turns out that marianne isn't really it her brother air quotes on brother is actually her real boyfriend fred um which explains why she keeps accidentally calling Ferdinand Fred over the course of the movie. Um, and she runs off with him and ditches Perot or Ferdinand, who she calls Perot, uh, over the course of the movie. <laughs> so I feel like pop art is a good explanation for this movie because while it's a there is big, technically bright, a structure, colorful jumble. Technically, it is a jumble. It is a jumble of very bright, very pretty things. Um, and a lot of techniques that are thrown together. And that's almost... So the first time I watched this, and I can totally see why somebody else would feel this way if they watched it for the first time. Um, it's it's a, almost a very frustrating experience. And not quite frustrating as in the sense of when everybody's constantly constantly obscured from the camera in Verve Savi. But it's more frustrating in the sense that the film technique is there but you see them all used and executed well in a way that catches your attention, but in a way that doesn't feel like it adds up to something. But really yeah. all it's trying to do is show you the futile, the, this, the futility of Fer, Ferdinand's quest. He's tilting at a windmill over the course of the whole movie. And yeah. we kind of just see his, this, it's almost like his idea of himself is broken down over the course of the movie. Like he, he he's kind of got like this noble intellectual idea of himself, uh, right. almost like a superiority complex that just gets crushed over the course of the film. Well, yeah. And so, yeah, that's what I've kind of been alluding to throughout the other films, because again, this is the film where he's got a lot more, uh, he has a lot of experience now. Again, he has this weird relationship with, not wanting to be a popular director, but wanting to be a great director at the same time. And so he's well, he still wants got to be like his, he wants to mimic his heroes who are unappreciated in their own time. <laughs> right. That's a weird he's, kind of self-deprecating version of, uh, of legacy. In, in a weird way, you can see a bit of Godard in Ferdinand in this movie where he just yeah. wants something real bad, but it's constantly out of his reach. Yeah, Criterion has an has an essay on this film that's literally called "A Self Portrait in a Broken Mirror." Uh, yeah, that's that's, that's kind of their good, take on good it. Good way too. to frame this. Um, broken mirror is a great way to frame this because time has no meaning in this movie. Yeah, and and I think yeah he calls it, you know, in, in a sense it's it's a painting. So in a sense, there's this this idea, and I think something that you mentioned with with the silence of the stealing the car bit made me kind of get on this track, but there's this, there's this intentional fabrication to the film. Like there's this intentional layer of, uh, of self-awareness, um, in the fact that, again, I think Godard is breaking away from all the, the classic ideas of what film is and film genre and stuff. And he's like, and, and also I kind of feel this this kind of goes along with his bio, right? Where he wasn't a real, really an academic. He kind of fell into this group of friends who happened to be really academic and philosophical and sort of discovered that he could keep up with them. 
but it's not really where he was coming from. You know, I feel like Truffaut came from a very philosophical and literary background and Godard kind of was following some of that and happened to be really good at it. But now he's like, this isn't really me. I'm more of the, sp the spontaneous, what, you know, just coming up with things on the fly kind of a guy. I'm and the he's wild really card. leaning into it in this film, but he's also doing it in a self-aware way. So when they're stealing the car off of this lift and it's all silent, it's almost like Godard is saying they couldn't get away with this without me. Right. Like there's no way they could get away with stealing this car because someone would have heard them. But as the director, I can hide their sound and I can help them get away with it. So he's kind of alluding to this this uh, master hand. He's he's kind of revealing the auteur in the background of the film in a weird way. There's even like the driving scenes, which are really, really obvious uh, studio builds. Um, and I think I think Piero actually. Uh, addresses the audience. He does. He he's they're they're driving in the car. Oh, they and he leans back break and the says, "Wall in this movie." Yeah. So this film also is like because he does that too. It's the same actor. He does the exact same thing in Breathless, where he does yep. the Ferris Bueller thing of addressing the audience. And so Godard is referencing himself, and he's referencing the audience, and he's he's putting this this facade. And I remember there's the uh, there's a quote from a Wes Anderson book that you lent me uh, a while ago and in the introduction the guy says all all films are fabricated some films are just more honest about it than others and so this <laughs> that's what Wes Anderson does he he just leans into the the fabricated nature of the film and just wants you to go along with him and Godard is kind of doing the same thing he's saying like I'm pull, I'm pulling the strings I'm calling the shots here uh and you yeah. you he's just go the, where I go the criminal squad in this movie yeah He's, he, you know, there, there's, th there's a trio of criminals in, uh, in Band Apart, and there's a trio of criminals in Perot Le Fou as well. There's and the two, one of them. Uh, two on screen and uh, Godard. Yeah, that's true. And just like, just like then, like there is a love triangle as well, because technically Anna Karina is still married to Godard at this point. Yeah, and I think, I think, actually, I think these three films were referenced in another video essay I watched where it was like. It's like Viva Savi is kind of Godard and Karina's honeymoon film. Band Apart is their freewheeling what a weird but troubled honeymoon film to middle. make about your wife being a prostitute. I know, right? Uh, there's there's the troubled but freewheeling middle part of the of the of the relationship in Band Apart, and then Piero Lefou is like the elegy of the relationship, <laughs> which is her stabbing him in the back or something along those lines. Yeah, yeah. It does not go well in the end. Um, yeah, I guess even at the at the end of Perot Le Fou, the main character elects to uh, in their life as well, although yeah. in like the most bumbling way possible, like a fool, like a clown, like, like a, a fool. sad, sad yeah. clown. Yep, like a sad clown Just wrapping a bunch of dynamite around your head, and then I could only, I don't even really know what went at what happened at the very end there. It's like he fumbled something, like he suddenly decided not to light it, light the fuse, but he did anyway, and then bumbled it and lit it and died. I don't fully understand, yeah. but I got the gist. Can't do anything right. Actually, that's a pretty good summation for this film. I don't fully understand, but I get the gist. It's yeah, like right. A pretty, pretty good, good, good sense of it. Because again, it's it's not about, uh, you know what's in the film it's about the effect that the film has uh yes. and this one is uh and and to to a certain extent it's really hard to describe that right over over a podcast or something like there's there's a very distinct like feeling or impression that you get from watching the film that can't really be summed up in a way other than watching the film yeah you need to watch the film to get having <laughs> to have any any kind of a, a shot at understanding what we're saying this one's really abstract and very deconstructed in that sense um and like you were saying jonathan very uh forthright with its fabricated elements so without seeing that it's hard it's so removed from the conventional language of film and the conventional structure of film that's hard to discuss it uses those elements that we're familiar with from the conventional language of film, 
but just not in the order you would expect it to be. Yeah, I think I remember a quote by Shane Carruth, again, to quote a dubious source, but Shane Carruth, who was influenced by the French New Wave, and he he talks about how he has this idea of film film being something almost closer to music, where you can't really describe the effect that music gives you without listening to the music. And there's there's a capacity for film to do that. Film can be something very straightforward uh, in its, uh, you know, kind of surface elements. But there's also other elements that are harder to kind of nail down in a in a verbal way. I think that's true of any art, though, like the 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 effect of reading like a really good book can't really be communicated. Yeah. Unless you read the same book. And even then, like one of the joys of art and also one of the frustrations of art is that that experience will never be the same between two people. Like, I feel like you and I are probably pretty in sync on our experience with Perot LeFou, but I'm sure if we go scene by scene, we'll feel, find a lot of deviations. Yeah. That's because we're two different people with two different life experiences. And that's that's one of one of the fun parts of of art and it's almost like <laughs> Kadar just made like a grab bag of a movie <laughs> and it was like here see how this works for you see how this goes i just went crazy a la carte see what happens yeah uh, and again i feel like there's a lot of bunwellian uh kind of impulses oh, this there. one's surreal surreal as heck man yeah yeah super surreal there's a lot also, of overlap there like as a person, like he's, I guess he's a good character for a character study, but as a person, Ferdinand might be like my least favorite person that we've seen in any of the movies so far. I just really don't like him. He's just yeah. so up his own butt about his intellectualism and also just like a terrible person. Like he ditches his whole entire family. Actually, he's the second person in this yeah. set of movies to ditch his whole entire family. And the only reason that they didn't in Band Apart is because they were too young to have families. Well, that we know of. <laughs> I guess that's true. But yeah, it does, it does feel like Pierre LeFou is a film that Godard is almost commenting on his, all of his old films and saying, I thought way too hard about these films and uh, yeah, don't take kinda, them too seriously. Yeah, he's kind of spoofing himself. Yeah. Like there's a lot of like intellectualism spouted by some of the characters, but if you try to cut into it, it doesn't hold water. Like the discussions in like Verve Savi do. Um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's like in, in Viver Savi, there's that really long philosophical thing. And that's probably the era where Godard is, is really into the, the philosophy. And he's trying to take all of these really thoughtful, insightful things and put them into his film and say, look at me, look how smart I am. Uh, and that's that version of himself is what he's parodying, parodying with Pierre LeFou. And I think there is a lot of really good meaty stuff in the philosophizing in Vivre Safi. But I think later uh, he feels like even even if it's decent philosophizing, just shoving it into a film like that is probably not appropriate. I don't think that he believes in the end that that's what film is for. Like you don't watch a movie to just listen to a long philosophical discussion. Now there's a lot of people in the French new wave who do not follow that, but yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, I think that's the conclusion he comes to is like, that's not what film is for. And honestly, like if I could communicate anything to the vast majority of films I've watched from France, from the second half of the 20th century, it would be that like, we don't need a prolongated philosophical discussion on screen. Stop it. But it's interesting um, because in Vivre Sa Vie, he does it both ways. We get all that philosophy through the way that he delivers the film. And we get it in the, in the, uh, the blank spaces, in the yeah. interims between the things. So he does the proper way of philosophizing through film. And then he also has the scene of just spouting philosophy, which interestingly is the scene that makes Nana kind of wake up. So by the time she's actually getting, and also that guy is literally a famous French philosopher of the time. So mm. that's like a true bit that's in there. But that scene well, where she talks to him. Yeah. But that scene where she talks to him uh, is kind of what makes Nana 
realized that, hey, I need to do something different with my life. So it's interesting that in that he uses it as a way to say that there's you need some amount of philosophical depth to give your life meaning, which Nana does not have up to that point. Uh, but also there are ways to deliver that philosophy through uh, the the medium of film that is not dialogue yeah. necessarily. Yeah, yeah, that's not what dialogue in film is for. Dialogue in film is for revealing character and advancing plot at the same time, if you have a plot, yeah. that is. But yeah, Jonathan, I think we should move on to overall notes now. Yeah, let's do it. All right, to summarize uh, Godard, he is probably most famous for being, for his style, for uh, his very unique style, which is kind of a result of his uh, willingness to experiment. Um, but we saw a lot of it today in these movies, and it's always a little different in each of his films. Um, but there's some stuff that tends to be pretty common. Um, for instance, the use of often atypical or unusual framing, sometimes, you know, just shooting the back of a character's head for a long period in a scene or putting something slightly out of frame where you can't see it. Um, it's frustrating for the audience, but it also generates interest in whatever that thing is for the audience, which is something that, uh, Godard uses not just in his cinematography, but with a lot of his work, like his cutting of the sound. Um, also, in all of the movies that we saw today, there was the use of mobile camera technology, whether it be a camera attached to a car, used in a car, or just moved around a whole scene for in a uh, detailed long shot. Um, he used that lighter, more mobile, and cheaper uh, mobile camera technology to his advantage. Um, there's almost always some inclusion of meta elements, um, whether it be being very straightforward with his plot structure, like titling and numbering the tableaus in um, Versailles, or breaking the fourth wall, which he does like every 10 minutes in uh, Pierre Le Fou. Yeah. Um, there's always something there. And this comes back to him being a nerd, but there's a, a pop culture references everywhere in his movie, whether it be... Well, not just based- pop culture references, but also literary references. That's yes, exactly. So there's there's both references to uh, contemporary culture, but also literary references, because he is a guy who's both obsessed with what's coming out now, uh, with the whatever movies are coming out in theaters now that he likes, or but he's also obsessed with the great works and the great philosophers of previous eras. So you'll find uh, references to um, uh, classical philosophers or German philosophers of the late. Uh, 19th, early 20th century in his works, as well as references to more recent American movies in his works at the same time. Um, he's That's gotta a, put references into a lot of his stuff. This is, there's a really interesting thing there, I think, with being part of a wave that I hadn't really thought of, which is that, you know, I, I feel like now there's a lot of people, if you are intellectually minded or whatever, and then, you know, you, there's kind of a distaste for the current films that are coming out because they are like what the French New Wave guys were reacting against, which is the kind of formulaic studio stuff. But if you're part of a wave where you and your friends have all talked through uh, what it is that you want to be doing with your art, and so you have art that's coming out currently that you think is really impactful and insightful, and and you know the people who are making it, so you can kind of have this conversation with them through your arts as they come out back and forth. Uh, there's, there's that interesting like group dynamic of we're all making stuff together. That's going to comment on each other's stuff. Uh, and we also have this, this history of literary knowledge that we're going to pull from at the same time. So it's not just this chronological snobbery of, Oh, only the stuff in the past is great, but it's like, look, there's, there's great stuff in the past and we're all making great stuff now too. And so that's, there's a multi-generational dynamic to the influences in these films. Yeah. And, um, in Cahiers du Cinema, they would free, they, one of their jobs, one of the things they did regularly was review new movies that were coming out and there were plenty that they were very fond of that were still coming out um, in the modern day as well. So, yeah. And also, not, all the guys that were their heroes were still contemporary. They were still making yeah, films. They were still so working. they have a lot of uh, um, a lot of inspiration right in front of them. The fifties and sixties were some of Hitchcock's most um, 
yeah uh, significant years in terms of his output um that's why we have the francois years. that's why we have the true foe hitchcock book exactly exactly um and of course we mentioned the dialogue a lot but it's very important to note how uh masterful the dialogue is in some of Godard's <laughs> movies in terms of being a masterclass of how to write dialogue that motivates both character and plot. I think Verve Sevi is one of the best movies I've seen from that aspect. I think Perot Le Fou, um understands that very well, but then uses it to pull one over on the audience because it's Godard kind of spoofing his previous style in order to kind of make himself the outsider again. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of, he's very good with dialogue, but he's almost always using it for a different effect based on which movie you're watching. So that's an important thing to keep in, keep in mind. Um, this goes back to the mobile, uh, te- uh, camera technology, but in almost all of his movies, there's some kind of prolonged conversation happening in a car. I don't yeah. really know what that's about, but it's so common in his movies. Like uh, the first, w- once I noticed it, I was like, Oh, it's like early Abbas Kiarostami, like conversations in cars, yeah. but no comedians and no coffee. Um, so that's a thing. I, my guess is that it's kind of reflected of of life. Like I can imagine some French dude in the 1950s in a cigarette is like, the most significant conversations happen in a car when you are not thinking. You just feel the road and life flows through you or some. And then you hit a telephone like pole and flip you and your car catches pole. on fire. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, even to that point, like the depiction of modern day life in Paris, France, um, even though exaggerated to certain extents in Verve Savi and Band Apart, I thought was very unique and almost time capsule like. Um, and that's a side effect of the low budget. Like they weren't really doing like big overhauls on the street to set decorate it or anything they were just kind of shooting with what's there and the result is like a weird time capsule of like this is what a cafe looks like in 1962 france it's like oh that's cool um and it gives the the movies a more grounded aspect um even when watching them modernly i think this comes down this next point comes down to godard being such a fan of american b movies made by people like howard hawks but the inclusion of crime as an aspect in all yeah. of his movies, um, I think is really big. Uh, one, from his fandom point uh, perspective, but two, I think there's something to be said because they're all character studies and crime is something that is so fascinating from a character perspective. Like the, there's so many questions when you find out that somebody is a criminal, like are, have they always been a criminal? What made them become a criminal? You know, what are they trying to get out of this? What kind of crime is it? Yada, 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 yada. There's so many character questions that pop out from that alone that it can make for such a good character study that it fits really well with uh, Godard's um, typical subject matter that he works on in his movies. And just from a from a narrative perspective, crime is kind of a... Uh, an extreme of a lot of our general negative character traits. So it's like, you know, and any, any common negative character trait when taken to an extreme turns into some form of crime. So if you're really looking at the dark side of people, just follow it where it goes and then just, you know, figure out what steps have to be taken to go from these, uh, more or less seven deadly sins yeah exactly you go from, you go from non-criminal aspects of your negative character traits and then you just follow all the steps that lead you to the uh the ultimate end of it yeah and it's it's almost always a good subject matter for a movie uh, i mean breathless was based on a real life story of a real car thief that Truffaut and godard worked on adapting for a long time I think originally Truffaut was going to make it, but eventually he didn't and Godard did. Um, and that became been breathless. very different. But as a even Truffaut though that film. one was based on real life, it, the idea definitely stuck uh, because most of Godard's narrative work is based around crime of some form or another. Um, I think it's also really important to point out and maybe a little one of the things that makes his movies a little harder to approach for modern audiences who don't have 
as much experience with low concept movies is the low concept angle of his of his films. We're used to like high concept movies, stuff that's very much based around plot. The plot drives everything and it, it kind of provides the reasoning for the character development um, and the theme to develop over the course of the movie. But in uh, Jean-Luc Godard's films, it's very much the opposite, which is the plot kind of happens uh, in the background in an abridged style and very much because of the character development. The character development is like the most important thing and drives the plot. Um, the situation's reversed. One of my favorite things that I, I watched while preparing for this episode was the um, the a trailer that Godard himself cut for Verve Savvy because it's not a good trailer. And I think part of the reason for it is because low concept movies don't make good trailers. Um, it's kind of hard to tease a movie like that that doesn't really have a big plot hook that happens. So I watched the trailer after I watched the movie and my impression of the trailer was that that was just the movie, but like in a minute, a minute long cut, <laughs> like you see the whole thing. You even see her die at the end. It's just oh the gosh. whole movie. And of course we can't understate the importance of Anna Karina um, and by extension, Anuchka films production company. Um, and over the course of Godard's, uh, most influential body of work, his 1960 to 1967 run uh, during the French New Wave. Um, she was in not all, but almost all of his movies during this period, and definitely all of the three we talked about today. And while we didn't have a lot of time to talk about her performance, she is a presence on screen. Yeah. Besides just being like drop dead gorgeous, she is uh, a very, very good actress who is making these like sometimes very complicated and sometimes almost like unrealistic characters feel very real on screen and have a weight um like the and we have quite a range today too like verve savvy is a very uh realistic portrayal of a young woman who made a very, some very foolhardy decisions and is paying for it quite dearly over the course of the movie, um, to all the way to Marianne in Perot Le Fou, who's almost like unreal in her actions and her attitude, but also provides like a compelling presence on screen. Yeah. Yeah. I read another thing that said, you know, the, the way that, uh, Godard's films feel with Karina as their lead actress is very different than the way that his films with any other lead actress go. And Karina's performance for Godard is very different than her performances for other directors. And I think that the personal relationship and the, the really strange, like subtle meta elements to the films that they made together have a lot to do with that. It's one of those things where, you know, Cer certain films can only be made a certain way at a certain point of time because of a certain combination of personal dynamics and stuff like that. And there's, there's is one of those really interesting, uh, artist and muse relationships that, uh, is kind of, it, it's not the only, the only one I think in, uh, in the French new wave or in film in general, but it is, it is a pretty keystone one of, uh, of, the this era of cinema yeah and of course we have the question of where does godard fit in the french new wave you know what aspects of the french new wave does he most exemplify and how can we kind of like at least in a shorthand remember him as part of the french new wave because he's definitely super associated with it and i think he's probably first the the thing he really represents from the French New Wave is the idea of rule breaking and experimentation. That's yeah. his jam. He's I very. Think of <laughs> I keep thinking of Taika Waititi's line from uh, "What We Do in the Shadows." Deacon is the bad boy of the flat. It's like that's, honestly, that's Godard. though, <laughs> Godard's like the bad boy of the uh, of the French New Wave, which is hilarious because he's such a nerd. Yeah, and I say that but with I think, a lot like of love. I, as like a, I was as a saying before, I feel like from uh, his bio, he's 
he uh, adopted the persona of a nerd. I feel like he was less naturally a nerd than some of the others, which is why he kind of has that uh, a little bit of that rebellious spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Although, you know, I, I guess from the film angle, he may, might be a little less of a nerd, but he was deep into philosophy even before yeah. he got there um, and psychology. So he he definitely has on the spectrum. He just wasn't as much of an academic, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's a good way to way to put it. He got <laughs> everyone else in the French New Wave has a 4.0 GPA. <laughs> and Godard has like a 3.2. And they're like, he's the bad boy. He's got a just 3.2. Just skating by, yeah. <laughs> like he's he's the kid who barely made honor roll. And they're like, he's not that much of an academic. He's the bad boy. Like <laughs> Like that's the vibe I get off of him. Yeah. Um, but which is hilarious. Uh, but it's also like important when we when we look at his films. Like what you were talking about earlier, I think really sticks to he's an experimenter, he's a rule breaker, he does not like to be put into a box. No one puts Godard into a corner, <laughs> especially not Godard. He does not like being pinned down. The second he gets stale or something works, he's innovating again. Yeah. Um, which is, is horribly ironic from one perspective because he's so referential, not just to old movies, but to old like philosophers and literary texts yeah. and pop culture that he likes, but he's constantly remixing it. And that's one of the important things to remember about the French new wave in general, I think, is that they're not trying to break down cinema. They're not trying as much as they claim to be a new cinema. They're not really trying to break what was there before they love what was there before. They don't like people who let it become stale. And so they're trying to breathe new life into cinema by remixing it and trying all these techniques that they've seen before, but slightly differently. And in yeah. this bold and unabashed way where they don't care if you notice either, especially Godard. Like we talk about uh, filmmaking that tries to be invisible and Godard's like the opposite of that. He, he knows... He knows that you know that he knows that you know that you're watching a movie. And <laughs> Which is why he, he can be kind of the the French grandfather of Wes Anderson. Yes. Yeah, that's why I brought up Wes Anderson. I think the cool, I, I think the stylized cool aspects of Godard and the crime aspects of Godard find a lot of life in Quentin Tarantino's work. And I think the, um, especially the pop culture references too, find a lot of life in Quentin Tarantino's yeah. work. But I think the overall attitude of being very conscious with your filmmaking and the construction of your filmmaking and not trying to hide it lends itself very closely to Wes Anderson's work. And I don't have the it in front of me, but I feel like I read that in the Wes Anderson book that you were talking about earlier, yeah. where um, I'm sure he mentions Godard multiple times or in his interviews with Bogdanovich, I'm sure he mentions Godard multiple times. Yeah. And speaking of of yeah, the way that the French New Wave is not trying to break down cinema. It's not a deconstructionist movement, but this is again going back to the point that I made at the beginning. It was almost like film film started by people who were very literate cuz before film there were only books. So then films come and films adapt a lot of the narrative technique of books. And some really great films came out of that, but the French New Wave was like great. So we know what things from books work on film, but what is film itself? Like, what are the elements that are unique to film that you can't really put, you can't really do th with books? And so they're, they're exploring all, they're like, they're probing. They're probing through all the things of the medium. What is film? What are the things that go into it? Where can we stretch it? Where can we uh, amplify it? And what, you know, makes it, a, a unique art form uh and so it's as opposed to being a deconstructive force the french new wave i think is actually trying to construct film from the ground up they're they're taking it for what it is on its own and building it anew and i feel like that's something that we kind of need to we we kind of need to keep at the forefront because again as film kind of gets to a place where it's where it stagnates and it kind of rests on its laurels and it just sort of takes films that have come in the past and remakes them and just reuses the same techniques. Uh, it, 
it loses something of what is unique to it. Uh, and so there's, there's a lot that we can still learn from the French new wave and, and the way that they experimented and weren't afraid to, to look, look the format of film in the face and figure out what's actually there. Yeah. 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 That's what we do here on the film. We're a bunch of film nerds who like to talk about film techniques and the course of film uh, overall over history and into modern day. It's what we do. That's what we do. That's what we do. Anyway, what are we doing next time on the podcast, Jonathan? Yeah, next time we are moving on to Eric Romer, uh, who was, again, one of the authors of the Cahiers du Cinema. And we're going to be talking about, yeah, he has a collection of films that are uh, dubbed The Six Moral Tales, that I think, Alex, you were saying he had written out as stories and then adapted them into film. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, later we, on. All of these are available as short stories. Um, okay. Although longer short stories. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to put that out there. Uh, yeah. Maybe novellas might be a better word uh, before being adapted into uh, films. Yeah. So we're going to pick three, three of the six moral tales. Uh, and those are My Night at Mods from 1969. Claire's Knee from 1970 and Love in the Afternoon from 1972. Not to be confused with the uh, Audrey Hepburn film, which I think is also called Love in the Afternoon. Yeah, so we're jumping uh, to the other end of the French New Wave, which is generally reckoned to end around 1972. Um, Again, like we mentioned at the top of the show, these things are not set in stone. So uh, some there's one or two movies that actually exist within what's commonly referred to as the uh, French New Wave oeuvre uh, that uh, come out after 1972. But uh, generally, that's reckoned to be the end. And uh, we are going to be talking about the six moral tales, what Eric Romer was trying to do with those, at least through uh, the three examples that we're going to look at next time on the show. And that's about all the time we have for this episode. To find links to things that we talked about today, as well as a complete list of past episodes and all 480 films we've covered so far, visit thefilmlinks.com. You can also join us for ongoing film discussions on our Discord server. And to stay posted about upcoming episodes, follow us at The Film Links. Summaries for this month's episode were recorded by me, Blue Jay. You can find everything I do at thebluejayproject.com. If you like the show, let us know. Leave us a review on iTunes so other people will know what we're all about. We definitely appreciate it. Talk to you next time. All right. See ya. Uh, There just becomes these long stretches where no one's brave enough to make anything different. It's so funny that you say that right after Pal World came out. Which one? This is a digression. I don't know if you follow this m- video games this well, but if you ask Chad, he'll tell you. Um, so you're familiar with Pokemon, right? Yeah. Well, Pokemon's just been making like the same game basically for decades now. And while they're still like good in the sense that they're the same game, they're just the same game over and over. Mm-hmm. You get your Pokemon, you go on your adventure. They A new slowly- challenger appears. Yeah, they like they change the area. They add new Pokemon, but you know, people are. You start to hear hear lines of like, "Oh, people are like, oh, we want something new. We want something different. We want something that that's going to take this to the next level." Well, this game just came out called Pal World. It's a very obvious Pokemon rip, right? Like, there's some some of the Pokemon even look like suspiciously similar. But the the trick is, it's Pokemon, but with guns. So it's super violent and all of the Pokemon what? use like weapons and stuff. And like, you go, you go out, it's, it's, it's way more violent and funny and crazy and over the top, but people love it. It's so popular right now. I think it's sold like 30 million units already on steam. Um, and it's had like a better release almost than any of the la- the more recent Pokemon games. And it's almost exactly what you said, where people are like tired of the same old formula. Somebody breaks it just enough and oh my gosh, it gets so popular. That's really interesting. I'm looking at images of Pokemon holding machine guns now. I did not expect this today. They're not technically Pokemon. They're pal Pokemons. They're Pokemon. I'm looking at them. It is basically Pokemon, right? Like some of them are like 
dangerously close to poke to just actually being the Pokemon that there's. Been. Yeah, there's here's like a weird Wario Pikachu riding a turret gun. Uh, okay. Yeah. It, no, it, it's pretty crazy, but it's been so, 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 so popular. 